Hey, it's Editing Mike coming to you live from Texas. Texas is known for many things, such as the Alamo, and we all know the great catchphrase about the Alamo, remember this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting a phone call. It's from Vanessa Zoltan of Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. I should answer this. Hello? Hi, Mike. Hi, Vanessa. So we have met twice, and it has been super fun both times. It's been a delight, and we've done live shows together and podcasts together as well. Yep, and when I'm on Potterless, you get me to spill the tea. And when I'm on Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, I sound incredibly smart about Harry Potter. So we have two very different podcasts. So we thought, what if we joined our two very different live shows? With our incredibly similar personalities. And brought it to New Orleans. Let's do it! A live show in New Orleans on April 9th at the Toro Synagogue. That sounds great! That sounds amazing! So people can find tickets on both of our websites. If you go to harrypottersacredtext.com or... Multitude.production slash live. And you will find links to tickets for our first joint Potterless Harry Potter and the Sacred Text live show with me and Mike in New Orleans on April 9th. I'm very excited. The only shame is that it took us this long to make this happen, but I'm glad that we are making it a reality. Absolutely. And it'll be right during Passover. So come for the Harry Potter, but stay for the Passover jokes. And eat some boudin and gumbo before you show up. Wow, that sure sounds like fun. If you want to get tickets, go to multitude.production slash live. And speaking of teaming up with wonderful people, we have new patrons to welcome to the team who teamed up with me to make this podcast possible. So shout out to Sarah Horton, Jacob Canning, Shayna Foreman, Chandler Folks, T Dunks88, Vanessa Campbell, Jesse Fang, Jennifer Silverman, Kule Cleghorn, Alyssa Frankel, and Marisa, a name correction for James and Durley. Shout out to Alicia Lyon who upgraded their pledge, and a huge shout out to our new producer level patron, Jacob Rossitano. They joined the ranks of Vicky Aaron, Jesse Clowmer, Cheese. Samantha Juan, Rose Marie, Marie, Lisa, Romina, Audra, Eleanor, Rossanne, Nikita, Ali, Amelia, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Ingen, Alex, John, Noel, Emily, Liz, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Summer, Andrea, Lynn, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Netta, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addy, Nikki, Kine, Amanda, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Sarah, Marta, Erin, Eileen, Violet, Lindsay, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Peter, Skyla, Adele, Professor, Threat, Ellie, Daniel, Lee, 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 Elizabeth, Michael, Tiffany, Kelly, Carrie, Connie, Mary, Jennifer, Jaden, Nedry, Will, Samantha, Kayla, Aurora, Emma, Out of Context, Marcos, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Ginny, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Jenny, Sarah, McKenna, Mary, Joy, Heather, Dead, Cat Lady, Javi, Darlene, Brad, Thomas, Charlotte, Brianna, Kevin, Lori, Chrissy, Bugaboo, Jarl, Haley, Emma, Ashley, Peta, Sophie, Jack, Jen, and Nicole, Callahan, Kylo, Leah, Melissa, Jordy, Bella, Melanie, Bill, Victoria, Joe, Elizabeth, Britt, Molly, Becca, Anthony, Rees, Adam, Madison, Kyle, Tonks, G, Sabrina, Sophia, Farzan, Melanie, David, Maria, Matt, Okamahime, Yimki, Bony Pony, Steamed Nuggets, and can't I bother? Who never say thanks you too when the person at the reception desk at the gym says, have a nice workout. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, Johnny and I just did another maturity corner with deleted scenes from the movie, so that's fun. There's also director's commentary, exclusive merchandise, discounts on the merch store, and more. You can go over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 114 of Potterless, the second of three parts about the eighth movie, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, guest starring Kelly Beckman and Ty Stafford. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who didn't read the Harry Potter series as a kid. He now read the books, and he's watching all the movies, too, as an adult, and talking about it with various Harry Potter fanatics. My name is Mike Schuber. I am that grown man, and I'm here joined in studio by my fiance. At the time of posting, I think you'll be my yes. wife. Will we be married? I think so. So that's fun. Hey, editing Mike here. Not my wife yet, but soon. Or at least very <laughs> close to that. <laughs> and uh, it's across. Getting close. <laughs> uh, it's getting there. And across the airwaves is an old YouTube buddy of mine, Ty Stafford. So, Kelly, how's it going? Good. Ty, how's it going? It's going great. That's fantastic. So, we're here to continue talking about the eighth film in the Harry Potter franchise, The Deathly Hallows Part Two. 
And uh, I think we should just get right back into it. Right back into it. Let's jump in. Cool. So we left when we last uh, when we last left our heroes, they were on top of a dragon flying away. <laughs> Each one of these has to start like the film, doing a, a previously on. <laughs> last time on Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two. <laughs> so they're flying on the dragon. They get dropped off into the water. And when they're in the water, something happens, which I really dislike. And it's just a way they've done the movies is that the way that they find out about Horcruxes is these weird clue like visions that Harry gets where he has these mental montages of sorts that give him insight about what the next Horcrux is and where he can find it. And it's just very sloppy and it's just how they've done it in the movies, it's like it leaves traces. Whereas in the books, they just got to figure everything out on their own, which I think makes it more rewarding when they do discover all the Horcruxes. So it almost Whoa, feels like cheating. But in the books, that feels like it's impossible, though. Right. Because in the sixth movie, and this is actually what I think is the the biggest letdown of the film franchise, is that the sixth book was not turned into two movies because – in the sixth book, there's so much more about the Horcruxes. There's some pensive trips between Harry and Dumbledore that they take out. And in those pensive trips is really what lays the groundwork. The main thing you take away from the sixth book towards the end is Harry getting an understanding of what Dumbledore thinks all of the Horcruxes are. And then book seven is Harry acting upon these instincts to find them. Now, when you say pensive trips... Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> it's the big bowl where they pour memories in That's and right. put their face in the water and then they like teleport. So in the sixth movie, they only show some of them. They don't show all yeah. of them and you don't get like all these clues and their work around for it. Cause they had to make the sixth movie not eight hours long was that quote unquote dark magic leaves traces and the traces are Harry getting these weird visions about what the next Horcrux is so and where silly. to find it. You know, I, I I did, you know, keep in mind I've not read this book. That's the whole point of why you're here. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really bother me as a viewer. Okay. Particularly that's fine. They really set the stakes in like recognizing like so what if we know where it is, we don't have a way of breaking it mm. or destroying it. True, true. So I still was like, okay, there's enough there to be like knowing that it's going to be a tough thing to actually destroy this thing, regardless if they have an idea of where it might be. I forget. At what point do they tell you that the snake is a horcrux? Not until the very end. Not us. The people watching oh, in the, the movie. Book? Oh, in the movie? Not in the book. Yes, they in don't the say movie. it until the very end. It's after they destroy the tiara. Uh -huh. Then Voldemort says, like, oh, I have to keep you safe, Nagini. And then right. Harry has another right. mental thing. And then he talks to Ron and Hermione. He goes, the snake's the last one. Oh. I know it. I can feel it. Gotcha. It is really convenient. <laughs> Very convenient. Yeah, it's super convenient. getting these in perfect order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like he's playing a video game and just some NPC comes up and is like, okay, Harry, you have one more Horcrux to kill. Right, it right. is the snake. He's unlocking. A cheat, like, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. it's like he has a pause menu and it's like goal mission yeah, yeah. <laughs> kill snake <laughs> yeah i mean that's good to know that it's not too distracting i again a lot of these gripes i think are just coming from you read the book you know how it's done and then they do it differently right so i think a lot of these things that people like kelly and i who've read the books and then seen the movies you go oh that's not how it's supposed to be when at the end of the day it's not the end of the world and mm -hmm. it like all a lot of these decisions make sense but I do think at the same time that it makes it a little more rewarding when they do figure them all out because there is no hint or clue or arrow above your character's head to, you know, follow on your HUD map in your video. Right, game. right. Now, let me ask you this, though, because this did bother me. And it's right after they get out of the water. Uh -huh. And Harry's referencing Voldemort and he uses the language, he who must not be named. Yes. I thought Harry was one of the few guys that just would sling that word out whenever he wanted to. Yes. So this is something they don't explain well in the movies. Oh, is yeah. It, it doesn't even happen in the movies, but it does in the books, and maybe this is why they're doing it. So in what would be the seventh movie, a chapter in the book, the way that Ron, Harry, and Hermione get caught by the Death Eaters and the Snatchers is they say Voldemort's name, and you learn that Voldemort has put a trace on his name so that if people say his name, you can find the location of who has said it. Wow. So Harry is, I think it's Harry. Harry says yeah. Voldemort really loudly. And Previously, then they, they have been avoiding is. saying it because Ron gets really like 
irritated by it and he was already irritated because of the horcrux and it's like a wizard superstition that you're not supposed to say right. his name so, kind so of to like thing. appease ron they weren't saying it but then harry gets into like a brain blast and mm-hmm. like yells it out and that's how they get caught right that feels like it should have been discussed in some capacity was it really not it was not in the seventh movie at all it seems yeah. like it's not hard to do but i guess they would have had to go through the extra explanation of what the trace is how they set it up right. and then, that how did they get found out in the seventh movie they just find them <laughs> what they just like the, oh my gosh. the snatchers just the them. opposite of the horcruxes <laughs> but then how do they explain the fact that hermione has really great enchantments set up around their tent uh, yeah i don't remember exactly people are probably screaming in their cars right now about what happens <laughs> but I, I remember being very unassuming of how they got found out it might have happened like right after they escaped from something and they didn't have time to set up the defenses or something Editing Mike will say how they get found out, but it's not through the trace. It is not through the trace. Mm -hmm. Hey, Editing Mike here. Past Mike was actually kind of right here. The squad escapes from the trap that Xenophilius had set for them with the Death Eaters coming to get them. They escape, and then once they arrive in the forest, they're trying to set up the protective charms and stuff, and the Snatchers are just right there. Scabior, Fenrir, Greyback, etc., they're all there. So it's not about saying Voldemort. They just happen to apparate right to where the Snatchers are. Pretty convenient. Anyway, back to the podcast. But something that is very funny about this scene when Harry is describing it and saying he who must not be named, which you're right, doesn't necessarily make sense in context of Harry being Harry, is that Ron, and this is something Kelly pointed out, Ron just can't get his shirt on (laughs) at all (laughs) because he's still too wet. He doesn't dry off. He just like takes off a wet shirt and then tries to put on a dry shirt. Oh my God. And if you watch, he can't get his hands out of the sleeve. (laughs) It is my pet peeve to try to put on clothes when you're still wet. Mm -hmm. It's just like, just use the dry clothes as something to, I don't know, do something. Don't just throw it straight on. <laughs> Hermione has a towel that she puts right. on. They I, could have used the towel. Oh, does she? Yeah. She's not even letting them borrow it as he's struggling. There is a charm that Dumbledore uses in the sixth book that instantly dries them off. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Hermione used it too in the books when they have a particularly rainy Quidditch game. She uses a thing to prevent rain from getting on yeah, Harry's glasses. she also dried them off. I don't know, but Maybe there is a wizarding spell that yes. they could use to dry off, but no, they don't do it. They don't got time, dude. They gotta find these horcruxes. <laughs> <laughs> get get so. my hands out of the sleeves. <laughs> he can't cast a spell with his hands in his sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> I've got sweater paws for hands. <laughs> so the movie cuts to Voldemort. After he has his rage where he takes out his anger out on all of the people that work at Gringotts by murdering all of them. And you've got a barefoot Mm -hmm. Voldemort walking through the pools of blood because Nagini has eaten a bunch of these dudes. And uh, it's just so gross to see the blood on his bare feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) So then you have the squad trying to get back to Hogwarts Castle because through Harry's vision, he knows that it has something to do about Ravenclaw and it's in Hogwarts Castle. He's not exactly sure what it is, but that's what they're trying to do. So they apparate into Hogsmeade and they set off the caterwauling charm, which is the charm that makes the alarm noise of cats yelling and then they get saved by Aberforth. Okay, I'm glad you just said that because I literally- Yeah, they don't explain it in the movie at all. I was just like, this straight up sounds like a cat's being murdered. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it's a charm called caterwauling, which the Death Eaters set up and literally just makes cat screaming noises when a certain person- (laughs) I have trespasses. a trespasses. But a regular alarm won't do. <laughs> I guess not. You gotta have a cat. I have a chip clip that makes a screaming <laughs> uh, cat noise when you open it. <laughs> it's very which I guess is good if you put it on a thing of dessert. But yeah, it's one of those things that's supposed to keep chips fresh, but it's the shape of a cat, and when you open it, it goes meow, meow, <laughs> meow. Is it a Harry Potter thing or is it just the chip clip? No, it's just a cat thing. (laughs) No, it's just a cat. (laughs) Kelly got from her roommate because her roommate thought it was very annoying. Yeah. Rightfully so. (laughs) Yeah. Because when you use this as a chip clip, it'll make that noise when you take it off the thing. And then it makes the noise again when you put it back on the bag of chips. Yep. Yep. It is incredibly annoying. Did we bring it to our new apartment or did we get rid of it? Oh, yeah. It's still there. Ugh. Gross. That was a gift, Jude. <laughs> it was a gift, Michael. <laughs> no, nice. it wasn't. Jen got rid of it because she hated it. No, Hannah got rid of it because oh. <laughs> she hated it. Jen and I used it all the time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they talk with Aberforth, and this whole conversation is done very differently. The mirror that they have where 
Harry can see Aberforth and Aberforth can see Harry. I always envisioned it differently. I envisioned it like a little handheld mirror, like the Beauty and the Beast one. Mm-hmm. Oh. Whereas it's just like a rectangular mirror on the wall at Aberforth. Well, I mean, he's hanging it on the wall, but it's not a wall mirror. Yeah, but it looks like too big to be a little handheld mirror. Harry's holding it in his hand. Because he just has a shard of it. That seemed wrong, too. Holding that shard in your hand, I was like, that's yep. so dangerous. So dangerous. So dangerous. You could cut an artery. Another thing that I thought was interesting is that Aberforth provides food for them to recover. And the meal that he brings them is bread and butter beer. (laughs) That sounds like what a barman would have. (laughs) It just seems like, oh, man, you guys need to rest up. Here's some crackers and Red Bull. (laughs) Or I guess Red Bull would make more sense. But it was like, here's some crackers and Bud Light. I don't know. Well, when they go into the castle, Neville's like, I brought you a surprise. And Seamus is like, I hope it's not some of Aberforth's cooking. Yeah. I can't eat it anymore. So I'm not surprised. Oh, yeah. dang. I couldn't tell what he was saying. And I just kind of brushed <laughs> it off. <laughs> we had the subtitles on. Mm-hmm. Very nice. <laughs> and I've seen it a hundred times. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So this whole conversation between Aberforth and Harry is done very differently in the movie. It's pretty rushed in the movie. And in the book, it's more laid out. The reason that it is rushed in the movie is that you miss out on this entire backstory of Dumbledore's past with his family and his brother and his little sister, Ariana, who is the girl that's on the painting, who's supposed to be 12 or nine young. 14. I don't think she's supposed to be that old. I thought she died when she was like nine. No, I actually, when I was reading the book earlier Uh today, the mom dies when Uh she's 14. Okay. And then she lives like another year or two. Okay. Do they explain in the book? Yeah, wait. Do you not know what happened to Dumbledore's family? They never say it in the movie. I could not understand. Like, what Harry eventually says what I said, which is just, I don't care about your relationship. <laughs> <laughs> because I was just like, let's move. Let's go. I was very curious because clearly it felt like he hates Dumbledore or he hates his brother. Yeah. Basically what happened, Dumbledore has a younger brother, Aberforth. And they have a younger sister, Ariana. And when Ariana's very young, when she's nine, before she would have been going to Hogwarts, she is doing like little kid magic in the backyard. The kind of stuff that like Harry would do when nobody was watching. Mm -hmm. Very normal little kid magic. A couple of muggle boys see her and then... The narrator does not say what it is. Yeah. They you kind can of, assume they just beat her up. They bully her. Yeah, it's written and try in a very to, vague way where you don't know the severity of it. Right. <laughs> Aberforth says they go too far. Yeah. And they basically are trying to make her show them the magic trick. And she can't do it under pressure because it's just like a little bit of magic. And so she freaks out and is never the same again. Well, but also Dumbledore's dad beats up. Does he kill them or does he, I, he just beat them up? I think he he either beats up the kids or he he does he retaliates he retaliates and he gets put against into the Azkaban boys jail and gets put it. into jail. Wow! Then Ariana is so scarred by this that she won't perform magic, mm-hmm. so they hide her away and try to keep her happy. But there are these points where she is a magical person but does not have an outlet for magic, so the magic just bursts out of her in these. I don't know if you've seen Fantastic Beasts, but it's the same kind of idea where the like magic an just obscurus. yeah, and the magic just like bursts forth and does chaotic, crazy things. Much like when you're a teenage boy and uh, you have wet dreams. It's like oh that, my gosh, but magic. Michael. That's what it is. <laughs> As you started that sentence, what? I was like, where is he going with this one? <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's what it is. But she's got this problem where she refuses to perform magic. So magic just like explodes out of her in a chaotic, violent way. She accidentally kills her mom when she's 14 by doing this. And then this is right around the time that Dumbledore has graduated from Hogwarts. So he comes home and becomes the head of the house. Aberforth was better friends with Ariana. He took care of Ariana while Dumbledore was out being the best at everything. Aberforth was forming a relationship with the sister and loved the sister. Not to say that Dumbledore didn't, but right. just loves the sister in a different kind of way. And he offers to take care of her, but Dumbledore says, I'm the head of the house. I should do it. Well, and also Dumbledore says that Aberforth is still in school at the time. So he's like, you focus on mm-hmm. school. I'll run the family. Right. So he, while he's doing this, Grindelwald moves in down the street and they're the same age and they have this idea of of making the world a better place together. Eventually they differ on what that means and how to do it and also 
I think we're supposed to believe at this point that they're falling in love right. as well. So it's like this relationship, uh, both an intellectual one and a romantic one. And he becomes distracted from his sister. Aberforth comes home and sees this. And the three of them, Aberforth, Dumbledore, and Grindelwald. Grindelwald are having an argument. And during it, Ariana just like can't take the noise and explodes in like a chaotic magic mess and one of them accidentally there's a bunch of spells rebounding everywhere and she dies wait so okay she didn't literally explode no no, no, no. no. she did one of her magical outbursts and okay. set off like a fight between everyone else there and ariana got caught in the crossfire so it's unsure of who, who even killed her even killed her yeah. but there is a chance that dumbledore killed his own sister right so like all of this the dad the mom and the daughter all died before Aberforth was even out of Hogwarts. Yeah. Wow. So he has, was... It's very complicated in that sense, the relationship. Right. Exactly. He has so much resentment towards Dumbledore because of all of this. Right. And I mean, I think he had a little bit of resentment towards him before because oh, Dumbledore yes. was perfect at everything. He mm -hmm. was a good student. He was a good athlete. He was a kind person. He was very likable. And a I think Aberforth was wasn't. Dumbledore I don't know. I don't, yeah, said that, I don't think he played Quidditch. I, mean, he I don't think he team. played Quidditch. Maybe he was on the Frog Choir team or something. <laughs> Gobstones team. He was on the Gobstones team. <laughs> but yeah, they don't explain it in the movie at all. In the books, it's done slowly over the course of a couple things. You learn about stories with him from Rita Skeeter and Aunt Muriel and Bethilda Bagshot, the lady that the snake was disguised mm -hmm. as in the last movie. She's Grindelwald's great aunt or something what she, yeah like Bethilda Bagshot is related to Grindelwald so that's really when, yeah so when he moved in he moved in with her that's why he was close oh. to Dumbledore so you learn all of these things bits and pieces wise throughout the seventh book and, and then, then when you finally meet Aberforth he clears everything up and gives you the full big picture of everything because everything you learn about it up until this point is hearsay and then Aberforth gives you like here's the truth of what really happened and then at the end of all of this, Harry's like, cool, I get that you don't like Dumbledore, that's fine, don't be a coward and give up, we gotta go fight Voldemort. And unfortunately, in the movie, all you get is Harry being like, I don't care, I don't care, don't be a coward, let's fight. You don't understand, like, why Aberforth is grumpy or anything at all. Right. The complexity of that character just is lost in the movies. Yeah, he's just kind of there. Yeah. It's fine. I'm frankly surprised they didn't remove him from the film. Because, like, what does he really contribute? Oh, he was necessary. For what? For saving Harry from being found by the Death Eaters in that moment. Yeah, but what if, like, Lupin just did that? And then Lupin told him to go into Hogwarts. It didn't need to be Aberforth. I'm confused of why they gave him so little, but well, then still decided he has to be in the movie. I would have liked Lupin to do that. Yeah, that would have been more, like kind of full circle with the story. Right. Well, but Aberforth was also the reason why that group of students in the Room of Requirement were surviving. Right, because the Room of Requirement opened the tunnel to the- Yeah. That's ball. a good point. Yeah. yeah. So their whole survival and their connection to the outside world was based on the Hogshead and therefore on Aberforth. Yeah. So yeah, now you know why Aberforth exists. Wait, so <laughs> what his whole deal blown? is? He hadn't really given up that much because he is allowing that tunnel to go through and is like helping these rebellious kids. That's kind of what they say. Do they say that in the movie or is that in the book? I mean, it's both. In the book, he's a little more just kind of pessimistic about the whole thing. He's kind of just like, ah, Voldemort's going to win. You guys are screwed. The Order of the Phoenix is so totally screwed. Well, but Hermione says something. I think it's in the movie. She says something like, that doesn't sound like somebody who's given up to me. Yes, yes. yes. So on the outside, he's like given up, mm -hmm. but he hasn't really... Yeah. He's still a good guy at the heart of it. Right. Yeah, that's good insight. But Hermione, with absolutely no chill, <laughs> which this is done, I guess, to catch the viewer up to speed, but Hermione just turns to Aberforth after looking at the painting of Ariana and goes, that's your sister Ariana. She died very young, didn't she? <laughs> Hermione, what? Yes, you know she did, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> what? That is bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. I get that Hermione's not necessarily the best in social situations, but read the room. Oh my god. Yeah, gosh. I wouldn't walk in and be like to anybody and be like, hey, is that a picture of your sibling that died really young and scarred you? Right, right. Oh, is that a picture of your dead mom, dude? Tight. <laughs> yeah, that picture is uh <laughs> looks a lot like that dead girl. Oh, <laughs> she was like really young when she died, too, right? <laughs> oh, that sucks, dude. She was like 15? Ugh. Big bummer. Anyway, you want to help us out? <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, you got any butter beer? <laughs> got some bread I can eat? Also, the way Aberforth talks about Dumbledore and the Ariana situation, did you get the vibe, just watching this, if I didn't know the true story behind it, it sounds like Aberforth is heavily implying that Dumbledore murdered Ariana. Like, not that it was an accident or tragic, whatever. It felt very much like he was insinuating Dumbledore killed his sister. With no context, I didn't pick that up. Okay. I was just picking up that, like, he just straight up hated his brother, and I just didn't quite mm-hmm. know. It, they kind of just, just as vague as, like, it could have been. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So the next thing that happens is he tells Ariana in the painting to go and get Neville out of the room of requirement. I'm still unsure of how all of this works. Even in the book, it's like you can see Neville in the painting, but, like, Neville's not a painting, so how would that work? <laughs> yeah. And then it opens. Does that imply, then, that the little girl could also one day come out of the painting. Right. That was something in the book. As I was reading, I was like, what the, what is, what? And then they just never explain it. So Neville comes out and Neville looks far too put together for how he's supposed to be described. Really? Well, in the book, they describe it that they do a good job of, he has, you know, the black eye and the cuts and stuff because he's been rebelling against the corrupt teachers. But in the book, they also say that his hair is all really long and he's got a straggly beard because he's been just straight up living out of the room of requirement for weeks. Yeah. They didn't do a good job, I imagine, of just of setting you up for, he, he has the biggest transition of like, he got hot all of a sudden. Well, they had to make him uglier. They had to put stuff on him to make yeah. the actor not look so hot <laughs> and unrecognizable. Can you imagine that Which I think being is the problem? biggest compliment ever. You are just too hot now, dude. <laughs> you are so hot that we have to put prosthetics on your face and buck teeth in your... Yeah, I remember when I saw him in the one of the... Maybe the first film, he looked so perfectly cast. Mm-hmm. I was like, dang, from the book to this, could not be better. But you just could never guess that he would end up being so handsome <laughs> he's the puberty champion of absolutely of puberty all champ. time it's also something that happened with daniel radcliffe emma watson and rupert grint there's an interview on youtube between jk and daniel radcliffe when i don't know if they had just finished the movies he's older it's a really good interview and jk at one point reveals to Harry, she says yeah i never imagined that the three squad members were particularly attractive students because they're not supposed to be super popular and then she goes on to say but then we did the casting stuff and of course you emma and rupert all killed it and you were all very cute on top of it but we couldn't say no (laughs) so i thought that was just a fun little note that she didn't everyone just ended up being hot right (laughs) (laughs) so they go through the tunnel neville catches them up to speed about what hogwarts is like now they get into the room of requirement and seamus makes fun of aberforth's cooking which is very funny and then a note this is another kelly note is that they play hedwig's theme the the, like the classic harry potter theme song the do 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 when when harry gets back and that's so great that they do because they haven't played that song in a minute because the past couple movies have been dark it's a really nice moment in the film and a good little break for you mentally to be like okay like we're in a place that kind of feels like a safe zone, at least for a minute, where we can just mm-hmm. take a mm-hmm. breath and be like, okay, cool. Like, the team's back together. We're finally back at Hogwarts. Right. And something that this is in the movie, not in the book, I think is great, is that they have the Potter watch, the radio broadcast thing set up in the room of requirement and whoever is the host uses the code phrase of lightning has struck oh yeah which is absolutely. such a great code Thank for you. harry potter's back that is awesome loved i it. loved that i thought it was great in that moment too i was just like one it was kind of clever i was like oh good like i'm glad they are using code because like it'd just be mm-hmm. too simple but like the cleverness of it i was like damn like they were ready with that. Like just in case Harry came back, they had that one. On they have lock. a whole code book of things. <laughs> so I want to know all the other ones they didn't use. You know. <laughs> yeah. What's the code for Hermione's back, but no one else is? I, what's the code for just Ron is back? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I believe the code for just Ron is back would be something's gone Ron. Hey, editing Mike here, and after that glorious pun, there's nothing else we can do except take a little break for when Guardian Madridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Pretty Litter. Let's say hypothetically that you haven't cared about your cat Crookshanks in a couple of books and you don't even have your parents to watch over your cat because you've banished them to Australia. You need 
to make sure that taking care of your cat is as simple as possible for whoever you're getting to cat sit crookshanks while you look for horcruxes, what's going to make that easy? Using kitty litter from Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is kitty litter reinvented. Unlike traditional litter, Pretty Litter's super light crystals trap odor and release moisture, resulting in dry, low-maintenance litter that doesn't smell. Now, I don't have a cat, but I have experience with cats. I used to live with one because my roommate had one and I hated him, and a factor of that was his litter box smelled like butt. I wish my old roommate used Pretty Litter so that our apartment did not smell like butt. And Pretty Litter is virtually dust-free because it's manufactured with a specialized de-dusting process, so there's less dust and no fuss. And yeah, that pretty much rhymes. What's also great is that it's shipped in a small, lightweight bag that lasts an entire month. My roommate had a giant bag that lived in one of our storage closets. Storage doesn't come easy these days, so I didn't enjoy having a giant bag in there. And finally, Pretty Litter is a health indicator. It monitors cats' health by changing colors when it detects potential underlying issues. Now, I know that cats can have problems and they can be expensive problems, so if your litter box is warning you of them, that is fantastic. So you should do what I will do in the future when Kelly and I get a cat and switch to Pretty Litter today by visiting prettylitter.com and using the code Potterless for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com with the promo code Potterless for 20% off. So go to prettylitter.com, use the promo code Potterless, save 20%, and make sure that whoever is cat sitting for Crookshanks makes sure that Crookshanks gets everything that she needs and doesn't die today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by DoorDash. Let's say hypothetically that you just got saved by Aberforth, and he's garbage at cooking, and he offers to give you food, but you really don't want it. But you're starving. You're really hungry. What are you going to do to make sure that you get some food that doesn't taste awful? You're going to use DoorDash to have stuff delivered directly to your door. Ordering with DoorDash is so easy. You just have to open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be delivered directly to you wherever you are. And not only are big chains available on DoorDash, but so is that little hole-in-the-wall restaurant. They have so many different options that it's probably there, and you didn't even know it. There are over 310,000 restaurant partners in 4,000 cities, so you could even find a new favorite restaurant, too. There's door-to-door delivery in all 50 U.S. states, Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. So you can order from whatever you want. And in Australia, I'm guessing you're going to get a shrimp to put on your Barbie. So with DoorDash, you'll never have to worry about your next meal, especially if that next meal is looking like it's going to be Aberforth's horrible cooking. Right, Seamus? Yes, Mike. That was my very Irish Seamus Finnegan impression, everyone. Now, if you are interested in this as a Potterless listener, you are in luck because you can get $5 off your first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Potterless at checkout. That's $5 off your first order, as long as it's $15 or more, when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Potterless. So use the promo code Potterless in the DoorDash app to get $5 off your first order of $15 or more so that you can avoid Aberford's horrible cooking today. Finally, today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Feels. Let's say hypothetically that you are tasked with saving the world and defeating an evil villain and all of his evil villain friends. You could be stressed. You could be anxious. You could have pain from all of the escapes that you've had to do recently. You could have trouble sleeping at night with all of the stress and the weird dreams that are going on. What could help you with all of these different things that are affecting your life right now? Some CBD from Feels. Feels is premium CBD delivered directly to your doorstep. It naturally helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. I've been traveling a bunch recently for work and for personal stuff, and I'm in all different sorts of time zones, and my body gets very confused. Feels CBD can help with that because I just get in a nice little sleepy zone, fall right asleep, and my body's not worried about am I on Eastern time or Pacific time or Mountain time. Feels is also super easy to take. You just put a couple drops under your tongue, and then you'll feel the difference within minutes. But keep in mind, the key to CBD is finding your right dose. Everybody is different. And thankfully, if you're new to it, they have real human being support at Feels. They have a hotline that can help you with your personal experience to make sure everything works perfectly for you. So with Feels, you can feel better naturally with no high, hangover, or addiction. I've had some great nights sleep with CBD, and you can as well. If you become a Feels member today, you can go to feels.com slash potterless, and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. That is F-E-A-L-S dot com slash potterless to become a member and get 50% automatically taken off your first order with with free shipping. Again, go to feels.com slash Potterless to save that 50% and chill out, get some sleep, reduce your pain so that you can go and kill Voldemort and feel great doing so today. So then they ask Harry, what's up? What's the plan? He says that they have to try to find this Ravenclaw themed item. They don't know what it is. (laughs) Seamus asks. It's very (laughs) funny in the movie. Yeah, I mean, that is, I guess, how it is in the book, too. But in the movie, you're a little bit more in the dark. And they're Mm -hmm. like, well, what does it look like? I don't know. Well, where will we find it? I don't know. 
why do you need it? I don't know. <laughs> like, it's just can't give him any answers. Well, and that's why when he ha- when Harry has these flashes of seeing the Horcruxes and whatnot, it doesn't bother me so much because, like, this very moment, he literally has no clue how to obtain this. But we needed that as a plot point for us to get to Hogwarts. Mm, yeah. The exact quote from the movie was Seamus. I think someone asked Harry, do you have something to go on? And then he's incredibly vague. And then Seamus goes, that's nothing to go on. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. No, no, Harry says, I know it's not a lot to go on. Oh, yeah, and to yeah. that, Seamus says, it's nothing to go on. <laughs> <laughs> So then Luna makes the suggestion about the lost diadem of Ravenclaw and says, you know, has anyone heard of the lost diadem, Ravenclaw's lost diadem? And then Cho Chang is like, but Luna, that's the whole point. It's lost, which I think was Zachariah Smith in the book or someone else. Someone else that isn't Cho says the same thing of like, Mm. or maybe it's Ron. Is he even mean somebody else in the book is like, it's the lost diadem. That's the whole point of it being lost, you idiot. I hate the disrespect that Luna gets because she's always right and smart. Right, right. You think that by this point, people would start to recognize the pattern. (laughs) Yeah. Which also, this is just a sign of the times. If this was not set in the late 90s, if this was set in present day, Luna would be the most popular person person in school yeah she Absolutely. would be the coolest person in the entire oh, yeah. school it's like oh that weird girl that reads magazines upside down and wears funky clothes and dances silly yeah she'd be so popular <laughs> so independent so then we get a wonderful scene we get Ginny coming into the room <laughs> of requirement and first seeing harry hasn't seen him in almost a year and i've tried to defend the actress that plays Ginny earlier in the series because I thought she got a lot of flack. Everyone's like, she's so bad, she's so bad. I was like, come on, she's just a kid. Oh, she's so awkward. She it's is so, so awkward. It's so bad. I don't at any point feel the connection that they're supposed to have. Yeah. None. It is an inert reaction. There is no chemistry. No, no there's nothing. <laughs> Even their kissing, it feels like, it's just like, this feels like, mm-hmm. just, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't match up. Just the way she always stands, and this is what happens. She runs in very quickly and then stands very still with her arms <laughs> exactly at her side. Very her straight. fists almost clenched and her arms very straight. It's, I believe Miel made this point for the sixth movie episodes. She looks like she's afraid of her limbs. <laughs> Like, she's afraid of her own body. It looked like she's still acting like she was supposed to in the second movie. Where she's supposed to be an she's awkward She's supposed child. to be afraid of everything. Right. And, like, doesn't want to, like, show that she has an interest in this person. But, like, they're, like, right. together at this point. Yeah. Yeah. In the books, it's something that is so well done and in the movies is done so poorly is that Ginny is funny. She is spontaneous. She is sassy. She is talkative. She is very confident, confident, flirtatious, like all of these things. No, none of that comes out. And in the movie, she's just awkward. She's just there. Reserved. Yeah, she's just there. That's really what it is. She's just there. And then they all sit around and comment on how awkward it is. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, uh. (laughs) But Seamus in this movie is fantastic because Ron gets upset that she's happy to see Harry, but not him. He calls himself. He's like, what am I, Frankie first year? (laughs) (laughs) And then Seamus goes, she's got other brothers. There's only one Harry. (laughs) So awkward. It's very good. So awkward. So then you have Snape calling all of the students into the Grand Hall to make this big speech about finding Harry Potter. Dude, I loved this part. Genuinely or ironically? Uh, I guess I, I, his cadence of communication <laughs> is so insane. <laughs> it is, it is. There's nothing like this really in the book. It's done very differently of how this all goes down. He does this thing. I don't know if you guys noticed this. He's like, and you'll be punished. Oh, yeah. E- Equally. Equally. <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, Equally. Yeah, equally guilty. I have written in my notes E and then the Equally. key for hyphen pressed seven times and then <laughs> quali. <like>, equally guilty. <laughs> Will be treated as equally guilty. My wife and I just looked at each other as soon as that happened and burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite Snape moment, I don't know if you if you talked about it, it's in the first movie before the Quidditch match. No, I didn't talk about this. He walks up to Harry before the Quidditch match. It's my favorite moment, I think, of all the movies. He walks up and he goes, good luck today, Potter, even if it is against Slytherin. 
and then he looks to one side, he looks to the other side, and nobody says anything, and he walks away. <laughs> Good luck today, Potter. Then again, now that you've proven yourself against a troll, a little game of Quidditch should be easy work for you. Even if it is against Slytherin. Yeah. Oh, my God. I still think my favorite is, I, I think it's also in the first movie when it's his first lesson and he just kicks the door open and then he's like, there will be no silliness or silly whatever in my classroom. There will be no foolish wand waving or silly incantations in this class. There will be no silly wand waving. There will be no silly. silly That's just the silliest way to class. walk in. <laughs> Carter, there will be no silly wand waving. Page 394. Turn to page 394. <laughs> Turn to page 394. Why are you talking so silly then, dude? <laughs> <laughs> also, his eyeshadow that Alan Rickman has on, quite intense. Yeah. It's just very vogue of Snape right. <laughs> yeah. while he's giving this speech. But in the book, it's done very differently. There's no sort of meeting or anything like this. There's the heads of house get together at some point mm. when there's the duel between McGonagall and Snape because the duel in the books is incredible and it is far superior. It's one of my favorite parts. It reminds me of the duel between Voldemort and Dumbledore in the end of book five. The duel between McGonagall and Snape is so intricate and well written in the books and in the movie it's just they throw some vague spells at each other and Snape flies out the window. And it makes me very sad. When did flying, just regular flying, get introduced <laughs> into this world? That's a big sticking point. I've talked about this in movie episodes. No one is supposed to be able to do this except for Voldemort. And it's supposed to be a big deal. Yeah. And then Snape does it in this one, which is another big deal. I feel like everyone's doing it in this one. <laughs> it's yeah, like everybody's movie doing five, it. Everybody just starts flying. All the Death Eaters can fly. They conflate apparition the teleporting thing and flying just into the same kind of thing. Yeah. And they don't really care. And it sucks. Well, additionally too, and maybe you guys can shed some light on this because I know Snape is playing a, a double agent of sorts. Yes. But when was he planning on clearing his name? Never. He was just going to go down because it was very lucky. And I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a little ahead. Yeah. Very lucky that Harry was there to collect his tears and be like, all right, yeah. let's go do this. Because if that were not the case, Harry would just hate him forever. Well, and Harry wouldn't have known what he had to do at that point. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it just see, it seemed like a very big flaw that Snape's willing to go undercover as the bad guy all the way to the very end. Yeah. It kind of Maybe he left a note somewhere for somebody. <laughs> just a sealed envelope. Like, open this if I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> I have turned my PDF on my laptop of the book, which I very legally downloaded, to chapter 30, which is the sacking of Severus That's Snape. That's where I am, yeah. What happens is Snape is hiding behind a suit of armor, which is very funny. What is that look you just shot me? I forgot that happened. <laughs> <laughs> He's hiding behind a suit of armor as McGonagall is walking through the halls. That sounds already so, like, such a shitty hiding place. <laughs> like, you can't perfectly, like, hide behind that. What it is is Harry and Luna are under the invisibility cloak, and McGonagall is walking with them through the hall. I believe at this point they have talked about trying to find the Horcrux in the castle. Mm -hmm. So they're walking through the hall. Harry's under the cloak. McGonagall can tell that someone is here. She raises her wand ready to duel and says who's there. And <laughs> the book says... It is I, said a low voice, and from, from behind a suit of armor steps Severus Snape. Your impression sounded like Squidward. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the vibe I go for. It's I go for a Squidward voice. So then Snape and McGonagall have a bit of a back and forth. Snape, at this point, talks about finding Harry Potter, which they've decided to turn into this big grand hall entrance in the movie. But they go through a little bit of a back and forth, Snape and McGonagall, and then they end up having this duel. And I just want to describe this duel because it is so good and I'm so bummed about how it was done in the movie. Snape says, have you seen, <clears throat> sorry, have you seen Harry Potter, <laughs> Minerva? Because if you have, I must insist. And then McGonagall takes out her wand, slashes through the air, and Harry is very surprised by this. So 
Um, I'm trying to do this so that I don't get sued. I'm not going to read it word for word. He, McGonagall shoots a spell at Snape. He throws up a shield charm. Then she takes her wand and brandishes it at a torch in the wall. So it flies out of its bracket. So then the flames crash down, becomes a ring of fire that fills the corridor she then uses her wand to make that into a lasso and throws a fire lasso at Snape. That's sick. That's awesome. As she does this, Snape turns the fire lasso into a giant black serpent and has that attack McGonagall. He takes the serpent, makes that into a lasso. <laughs> so she takes the serpent, blasts it into smoke. Then it reforms and solidifies into a swarm of pursuing daggers that she shoots at Snape. The only way Snape avoids these daggers is by taking the suit of armor and putting it in front of him. All of the daggers sink into the armor, and then Flitwick and Sprout, to the other heads of house, come down, along with Slughorn panting behind them, and then... Flitwick is super upset. He's going to start attacking Snape because in his mind, Snape has murdered Dumbledore, so he's a bad guy. So then they are chasing after Snape. He runs away from them. He goes into an empty classroom. He jumps out the window and then flies away with what the narrator describes is that he looks like a bat. And then you learn that Snape can fly. And that is the duel that they've ruined in the movie. Now, why did it even start? In the movie? In the book. Or in the book? In the book, it was because, I guess it was- Minerva was at the end of her rope. <laughs> yeah, okay. Snape made it clear that he was looking for Harry Potter. Right, and, and that's it. Minerva's like, well, this it. is the end. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what happened in the book. Makes me very sad. Which I do wonder, was he looking for Harry to tell him this? Oh. Was he know, actually, mm. was this his end game, was to find Harry and tell him- the, the, what he had to do. What sucks is, I mean, given McGonagall's situation, you can't blame her because how is she to know that Snape is a good guy? Yeah. Well, killing Dumbledore wasn't enough for her to fire back at him? <laughs> I guess, but this was just the moment was right. I guess because she knew she had Harry and Harry just had to get the Horcrux. Yeah. I could forgive Dumbledore, but wanting to know where Harry is is too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also like, I think she's also pretending just enough to stay at the school to be helpful. That right. feels and right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... That's why she hasn't killed him at this point. <laughs> but now she's like, screw it. My career is over. Harry's here. <laughs> so in the movie, you've got all the students standing there. Also, something that doesn't make sense is that it looks like the attendance of Hogwarts has multiplied or at least is the same as it was in the movies. But in the book, you're supposed to have fewer people attending Hogwarts because of all of the people that aren't pure blood wizards oh. are not at Hogwarts. I didn't get that. It was overly full. It's too full for what it's supposed to be in the book. It's supposed to be just pure bloods at Hogwarts now. Hmm. Because all the other people have either been inquisited by the ministry or are hiding or whatever. Basically, the only people who are safe are pure blood wizards. To be honest, I thought it when Snape had them all in that that zone, I was like, this is it? This is the whole school? You thought it wasn't that many? No, I, th I, I was justifying it like, okay, maybe this is just... A single house that he had, but then there were Slytherins in there. There was a bunch of different people. So there are supposed to be less now than there used to be because people are getting homeschooled or people are getting kind of picked off. There's that whole crew that's hiding in the room of requirement. But yeah, I didn't think. Mike, your reaction when we were watching it was like, there's so many people here. That's not what I felt. It looks like there were too many people there, but that's just <laughs> me. So you have this thing where he's given the whole thing and, you know, and trying to get them to to say Harry's whereabouts. Apparently, if you watch this, you can see Harry in the oh, group really? of them. Johnny pointed out when we did Maturity Corner on Patreon, but I, I didn't see it this most recent time we were watching it. And then Harry steps out and delivers this line, and I didn't even write it down. It's just so cheesy. It seems that you've got a bit of a security problem, Professor, and it's rather extensive. <laughs> yeah, and then everyone comes out, and then he goes on and it's like, how could you? How could you stand where he how stood? Could you stand there. And you've murdered him. There's this meme of like Snape responding to that by saying, What do you want me to do? Float? And then just like Snape floating throughout the castle. <laughs> <laughs> so then McGonagall steps up 
and dual Snape. And I love Maggie Smith a lot. She's fantastic in this movie. It's not that this is bad. It's just not as good. I mean, what? you don't get you don't get fire lasso yeah, and smoke yeah, yeah. daggers. Come on, like way better than just vague spells. I do like that she attacks first, and Snape looks like he's on the defensive, so she's kicking ass, and then he has to fly away all dramatic like. But it made me sad that it wasn't done exactly as depicted i wanted to see fire lasso and smoke daggers it was cool her energy going in there was like very badass yeah she had the confidence she had the upper hand snape is instantly on the defensive and he has to get out of there because he's about to get wrecked which is cool i think it's pretty sweet although is it this scene so when snape leaves is when voldemort now is like all right voldemort give him up. launches his new asmr podcast <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've never tried to do ASMR in these microphones here, but um, apologies in advance to Brandon Grugel, our audio engineer who hates ASMR. Give me Harry Potter. You have one hour. And then you have the people screaming, but it's just like, it's very, he invented ASMR. Absolutely. I'm surprised no one fell asleep. <laughs> Harry Potter. No, you got to get right up on the mic. I want Harry Potter. Give me Harry Potter and you will be rewarded. I don't want to spill magical blood, but give me Harry Potter and no one will be hurt. I don't want to wake up my mom sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Nakini is taking a nap right next to me, and I'd rather not wake her. She's had a long day. <laughs> Uh, but it's really good. The effects are done very well. It's very. What are th what is this tinkling that you're doing? Oh, you're doing new s. You're doing straight up ASMR. Isn't that what it is? <laughs> it's like you tinkle a glass. You and they like the scratch on the sides of a microphone. <laughs> the rest of this podcast will be done as an ASMR. We have a fake plant in the studio. Episode. I'm now r I'm rubbing the fake plant on the microphone. <laughs> I'm gonna have a field day editing this. <laughs> <laughs> but for the movie, Ooh. the voice inside the head thing, what are you going to say? Nothing. What are you going to say? Uh, nothing. What are you going to say? Oh, nothing. What are you going to say? I, okay. What? Apparently one of the things you can do is eat nuts, and I know you've got a no, bag we're not full of nuts eating, over there. No, we're not subjecting the Potter's listeners <laughs> to I'm eating just hungry. <laughs> so the voice inside the head effect in the movie is so good. It is legitimately yeah, terrifying it's good it made me wish that i had surround sound i kind of want to mm -hmm. watch it at joel's house my dad's house he's got a great surround sound system in the media room i would love to feel like voldemort was inside of my brain i don't want to feel that way i do the the whispering <laughs> is so much more menacing too like it mm. does feel legitimately scary yeah it's one of those he's too calm that it's scary moments yes mm -hmm. why are you so calm kind of thing but then Ginny does the incredible, awkward standing in front of Harry when Voldemort says the whole thing of just give up Harry Potter. And then Pansy Parkinson goes, well, he's standing right there. Get him. Uh, and then Ginny rushes in front of him very awkwardly and then stands perfectly still in front of Harry with this deer in the headlights look in her yep. face. Uh, it's just so. It's bad. It's so awkward. It's bad. Well, and when McGonagall she tells someone to to send that girl in all of Slytherin into like the, yeah, the basement, like to the dungeon. So now you have just shown that there's basically one evil group. Right. So this is a big thing that I don't like and that Kelly doesn't like. This was uh, when I was on the book episode for this one. I said there were two things in the end of the book that the movies did absolutely wrong and this was the first one because in the books mcgonagall says anybody who's underage you have to go home you don't mm -hmm. have a choice right. anybody who's of age you have the choice to stay and fight but we won't force you to and then what happens is that all the slytherins choose to leave right and there are a lot of gryffindors a fair amount of hufflepuffs and some ravenclaws mm -hmm. but in the movie she turns it into you all are the evil house. I have now declared you're all evil. Whether it's your choice or not, get out of here. Right. This is something that if I ever interviewed JK or the people that made the movies, I would ask about. Because I wonder if this was a regret of JK in the writing of the book. Because I think it is absolutely bonkers that not a single Slytherin student in the books stayed back to fight. People have reached out saying that a lot of Slytherin 
parents, so parents of Slytherin kids, were Death Eaters. So it would be, oh, my dad's a Death Eater. I'm not going to fight and potentially kill him. I can understand that. But I wouldn't think that every single Slytherin right. student would have a parent or relative as the Death Eaters. Harry was coming. almost a Slytherin. Right. And I also think, wouldn't that be such an interesting character? Right, if, exactly. say, Zabini was the one Slytherin that stayed back, Mm -hmm. that would be such an interesting character development. I just, it seems like such a missed opportunity. And I wonder if when they did the movies, JK was like, yeah, that was kind of a bad look that not a single Slytherin, because it makes the house look bad. Well, then why not just have one of them stay? Uh, Yeah, that's that's what I Like in the movies, you don't have to turn it into, all right, we are now declaring that they're the bad house rather than them choosing to be the bad Mm -hmm. house. An evil house, yeah. It's such a weird decision. And it's kind of like a bailout moment for Slytherin. Whereas in the book, it's something that is really damning. And when I say in the podcast, jokingly, of course, when I say that all Slytherins are trash, what I mean is all book Slytherins are trash. But this is something in the book that really stands to that is that not a single kid stayed back. And yeah. In the movie, they just don't do that. It also doesn't make you intrinsically evil to suggest giving him up. And imagine how fucking scared you are and you are a child. Right. I was going to say I mean? the other like the inherent quality of Slytherins is an ambition and a cunning a cunning ambition and it's not putting yourself out on the line it's not loyalty it's not bravery and it's not intelligence Mm -hmm. which would be the three qualities that might make you stay Mm -hmm. it's cunning and if you're cunning you're gonna get out of there when when you're still alive yes so i mean like even if there are good kids in slytherin maybe they're still kind of they're not evil, but they're still a little self-serving. Right. And so they don't stay. Yeah. Right. I, I just don't know if that deserves the dungeon yeah. <laughs> to, to suggest that. It's, yeah. It's, in the context of the movie, it's bonkers for Pansy is a jerk. And what if there was a good kid or two in Slytherin that wanted to stay back, but then all the dungeons like, oh, Pansy, you ruined it. I wanted to fight. Come <laughs> yeah. on. Right. Just because this one girl wants to give up Harry doesn't mean that I don't want to stay back and protect him. I like Harry, you know? Yeah, right. Just no option. You're, you're evil now. On the flip side, though, something that they added in the movie that they did not have in the book that I think is really smart is the meeting, the little tiny get together meeting that Ron, Harry and Hermione have before they go their separate ways. Mm -hmm. So in the movie, they go on the stairs and Ron comes up with the idea, which Hermione calls brilliant, is says, hey, we got to get stuff that can kill the Horcruxes. We know Basilisk Fangs can do it. We're going to go to the chamber and get some Basilisk Fangs. And Harry goes, yeah, that's smart. I'm going to go find the Horcrux. And then they split up. In the book, what just happens is they get separated. And then Harry doesn't know where Ron and Hermione are. He decides he has to just find the Horcrux, though. And he doesn't know where they are. And then later on, he meets up with them. And then Ron says, yeah, I figured we should get some Basilisk Fangs. So Hermione and I went down to the Chamber of Secrets and got some Basilisk Fangs. And it's... Something that I never understood in the book, they could have just done this, and they did in the movie, and it made me so happy that they did it. I was so happy. (laughs) And it sets up again, Ron having a great idea, Mm -hmm. executing it flawlessly, and looking like a badass. It's great. It's truly fantastic. Also during this scene, though, in the movie, it's like incredibly chaotic, and students are just running around everywhere. And I think that's a product of McGonagall's speech not being right. As in... (laughs) Like, all the little kids are running around, the kids who would have been sent home, Mm -hmm. and all the people who didn't choose to stay are running around trying to figure out how to get out, and, you know, they would have gone home, too. Yeah. So, everybody's just, like, chaotic running around rather than, like, preparing for a fight. And in the book, there's more planning. McGonagall and even Kingsley Shacklebolt comes up, and they have more strategy. They tell certain people to go into certain towers and stuff. Like, there are particular places where all of the students go and Mm -hmm. stuff. So it's unfortunate there. And uh, Miss Weasley shows up and tells Ginny she has to stay behind mm-hmm. because she's underage. Yeah, it's in the book. And she's not allowing her to stay. Yeah, that was a good good moment. Right. So, Ginny sneaks out, obviously. Yeah, of a thing, though, that they don't add, and they still do, that makes me upset, is eventually when they go into the Chamber of Secrets, Ron talks into it. We will talk I, about this in the oh, next episode. Oh my God. We'll, we'll talk about this because I hate it and Kelly I defends am it. I'm ready to defend this. We will do that in the next episode. But just because I think they could have added that in the meeting, what I was clamoring for in the book episode was that they should have had this little meeting. So I'm glad they did it in the movies. But I think also it would have made sense with the whole parcel tongue, you need parcel tongue to open the door thing. I thought what should have happened is Harry goes with them 
opens the chamber and then leaves to find the Horcrux. That's what I thought should have happened. Eh. We'll get to this when they actually open the door. Beautiful. But we will save that for the next episode of Potterless, which will be the final discussion of this movie. Time but flies. It, time flies when you're dunking on movies about children's books. <laughs> but Kelly and Ty, thanks so much for coming on. Kelly, is there anything that you would like to promote to the listeners at home, at work, in their cars, on the sidewalk? Um... Drive safely. Mm-hmm. Walk safely. Mm-hmm. You were uh, going to promote BTS. Oh, you yeah. Told me in the bathroom. Go listen to BTS. They're awesome. They're amazing. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Them. Don't make me pick between all of my What loves. are three of your favorite songs? I'll give you five. <laughs> what are five <laughs> songs that you like by them? Number one is Serendipity. Okay. It's the most beautiful. Just the, just the songs. We don't have time. Okay. <laughs> Or one is Sarah. Oh, I can't do this. Hold on. Oh my. Okay. Cut, wait, cut, cut all this out. In the meantime, Ty, is there anything you want to promote while Kelly figures out her best five songs from BTS? You know, I'm glad <laughs> you asked. And, and I, I really want to promote hand washing in this episode. <laughs> I think that particularly right now with all this talk about different viruses that are true, out there, true. this is legitimate. Everyone's trying to buy masks on Amazon, and there is very little evidence that that does anything more than simply washing your hands. So people, wash your hands, and check me out on Instagram. (laughs) (laughs) Ironing my underwear, right, on Instagram? That's right. Ironing my underwear, one word. (laughs) I suddenly feel like what I'm promoting is just silly. Yeah, everybody stay healthy. (laughs) We looked it up about the coronavirus thing is that putting on the mask is only good if you already have it. Like, it's good for preventing the spread, but it doesn't. Right, stop you right. from catching it. But yeah, wash your hands right. a bunch, please. Use soap. Kelly is counting songs <laughs> on her hand. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. At the risk of sounding basic, Boy With Love. Boy With Love is perfect. But Boy With Love is amazing. Mm-hmm, that's two. The risk of also sounding basic, mm-hmm. Idol. Idol is also perfect. Because Idol is also amazing. Mm-hmm. <sighs> two I'm more. I'm literally writing these Only down two. right now. They're like, great. They're all bops. Game. They're all bops. Magic Shop. Magic Shop. And one more. Oh, don't. One um, more. Okay. Um, Best of Me Airplane Part 2, Blood, Sweat, Tears, Not Tears. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly and Ty, thank you so much for joining on. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> <laughs> and as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter before they play this sweet BTS playlist that Kelly has put together. Uh, I'm sorry. There's like seven okay. songs on this playlist. <laughs> uh, Wizard on! (laughs) If you just can't get enough Multitude Fix, you should check out the Multicrew, because you can join for just five bucks to get access to Head, Heart, Gut, the friendly debate show. You will immediately get access to the feed, which has all of the past episodes, which I've been on. I've won twice, and every time that I didn't win, it was a crime. You should hear my performances. It's fantastic, and there's so many other great ones. They just wrapped up Rock, Paper, Scissors, which was hilarious. You don't want to miss it. If you want to sign up and learn more, go to multicrew.club today. Potterus is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Klaus Lopu, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Ponce, Anfilio, Rosemary, Dodge, Marie, Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadonier, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Ross Ann Batamana, Nikita Power, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orca Grower, Vivian, the Owl Takari Ron, Haley Hastings, Moster, Ingen Oddstadter, Alex Consilver, John Codker, Noel Basile, Emily Tyrell, Liz Bigelow, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Ensign, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillen, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Mark, Lou, Friday, J. Svensson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Summer Rathal, Andrea Crock, Lynn Walker, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Paris, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Ned Atabani, Zina Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Addy, Nikki Harris, Kine, Ahmed Alfred, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Placky, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Aaron Richter, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Lindsay Towning, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Maya, Kieran, Lily Leader Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Floor Sake, Siri Scars, Ford, Georgia, Peter Wyckoff, Skyla Lily, Edel Ryan, Professor Threat, Ellie Hoskov Chova, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Lily, Elizabeth Christofferson, Michael David Yordi, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly O'Till, Carrie Krempler, Connie Binkowski, Mary Mateel, Jennifer Wendt, Jaden Allman, Nedry OS, Will Huser, Samantha Lenz, Kayla M. Simino, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Out of Context 69, Marco Cepeda, Hannah Zeters, Courtney Spilker, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Ginny from the Block, Anna Penalber, Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Jenny, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Mary Joy Moa, Heather, Weekend at Dead Cat Ladies, Javi Guadalupe, Trejo the Third, Darlene Kerr, Brad Harding, Thomas Chavara, Charlotte, Brianna Cusimano, Kevin Stewart, Lori McDonald, Chrissy Tew, Bugaboo, Charles Fiven, Haley Logan, Emma Ashley Enstrom, Peter McGrath, Sophie Duda, Jack McMahon, Jen and Rose Dab, Nicole.
Bell, Linzer, Callahan, and Deras, Kylo the Husky, Leah Reed, Melissa Robb, Jordy Wright, Bella Barlack, Melanie Demi, Bill Gill, Victoria Cole Perry, Joe Radwan, Elizabeth Yu, Britt McLean, Molly Bautista, Becca Spry, Anthony Reese, Dignan, Adam Graham, Joseph Torp, Courtney Harris, T Run Money, Madison Kyle, Don't Call Me Nymphadora, G, Sabrina Balsiger, Sophia Loves Pigs, Farzan Herabat, Melanie Duhreif, Maria, Matt Barger, Okamahime, Yimki, Boney Pony, Jacob Rossitano, Steamed Nuggets, and Can't I Potter, Web Design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Kumbamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at Facebook.com slash Potterless, Twitter.com slash Potterless Pod, Instagram.com slash Potterless Podcast, and Reddit.com slash R slash Potterless. For any and all information about the show, you can go to PotterlessPodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to Patreon.com slash Potterless. And for merch, you can go to PotterlessPodcast.com slash merch. If you want to see us live in New Orleans with Harry Potter and the Secret Text, go to Multitude.Production slash live. If you want to tell someone about the show, whether it's in person or through a review online, that really does help. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, as I say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, wizard on!